hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of The Bible Wait. What? That was me. No, it wasn't me. That was Adrian Schlosser. Yeah. You're the first guest who's done it properly. I'm super happy about that. You are <laughs> definitely the first guest. Have you been practicing or has you just got the right voice for it? Because you've got quite a deep baritone voice, but you can you can put it up there with Aww. a what when you need to. Yeah. You've got a real radio voice. Oh, do I? Yeah. Has anyone told you that? Nope. <laughs> well, there's a saying that goes, you know, you've got a good face for radio, but you you actually are a very handsome man. So you've got a good face for television and video like we're on YouTube as well. You're embarrassing me now. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have a good, deep baritone voice, easy listening. Well, I'm glad you told me I have a deep voice because I, I think I do. You, you like, do. Uh, okay, thank you. <clears throat> you do. You and Shannon Moyer, who's on an episode here from Thoreau, he's, he's actually done spruiking and radio announcing. He's got a good voice for this too, but... You sound really good. In my headphones, at least you sound like you've got an easy voice. Oh, knocking my iPad over there. <laughs> All right, we're going to do chapter 10 of Romans today. So we're continuing on from yesterday's episode. So if you didn't listen to that and you want to, go back because it's all 9, 10, 11, especially is one continuous flow of thought, largely to do with God's plan for Jews and Gentiles and grace and salvation and yep. who gets saved and all that. So all that jazz. You want to kick us off in chapter 10, see where we go there? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll kick us off. Uh, chapter 10, um, there's no like heading for this one. No, because it's literally straight continuing from previous thought. Which is nice. There we go. Our brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the combination of the law so that there may be culmination. Oh, culmination. Culmination. Com- com- culmination. Com- culmination. Yep. Culm- culmination. Culmination. That's it. Whoops. That's all right. <laughs> uh, where was I? Combination of the law so that there, there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. And then it's got in brackets, that is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep. Brackets again, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. Famous current verses coming right up. Yep, it certainly If is. you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with you, um, it was, could as, no, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one uh, one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has uh, believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand first? Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. I thought I'd just that read it. That was a mouthful, wasn't it? It was a mouthful. I thought I'd just read it all <laughs> yes, out. Yes, oh, it's all one flow of thought, yeah. and it builds upon 
one after another. I mean, this is the sort of stuff, if you've just listened to Adrian read that and you've gone, what? That's okay because it is, um, it's, it's very extensive, very well thought out, reasoned argument, but the sort of argument that we're not going to have the ability to go into every depth. People write PhDs on one verse from Romans. <laughs> I mean, it literally is some of the most in-depth stuff going around. But people say that Paul's writing in Romans is amongst the most intelligent, articulate writing of any literature anywhere in the world. Well, I'm enjoying it. Just You're enjoying it just by reading it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you can also see why people go, wait, what? Because <laughs> it is it is quite con- challenging at the depth of it. Like As you were reading through there, I um, was just towards that second part there, I just, every time you, you quote, he quoted something, I just went, I just opened it up on my Bible. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, t- at least 10 times in those, probably the back half, two thirds of the chapter, he's quoted an Old Testament verse. So he, he knows his Bible. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And he's using examples to build his argument all the way through. I mean, he's doing that because he wants to tell these Jews, hey, guys, I know my Bible too, remember? My heart is for you. Let me argue this whole grace thing from your own Bible. Yeah, like that's great. Like I know it's like, oh, why write the same thing again? But it's it's so helpful that he's done it. Yes. It's because like you could literally be like, oh, I'll read that. Where does is, where is this say this? And it points you exactly to where it is. And it's like, oh, okay, he's he's not just he's not just like, oh, I say this. But like, this is where it actually is. And That's I right. say this, this is according to yep. like God's heart. Yep, exactly. You got Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, in, because it says, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer for God, for the Israelites, is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them. Who's them? The Israelites. So The Israelites? Yeah. My heart is that the Israelites, the Israelites would be saved. Might be saved for I can testify. I can testify that they are zealous for God. They're trying to do what they think is right, is what he's saying. Okay. Like z- zealous is, what's a zealous? Zealous, zealous is, is, zealous means, um, it's actually a biblical word, it, it, but it means someone who is, like is passion. 100% passionate and switched on okay. and active in their passion. Yes. So there's a whole Jewish group of people at the time of Jesus called the zealots who were a, a group of freedom fighters, Jewish freedom fighters who were zealous against Rome. So they would fight against Rome and they were called the zealots. Paul actually describes himself. He says, I was zealous for the law. Um, he describes his passion for God. He just says, basically, I was 100% switched on for God. I was just deceived. I didn't realize that in my zealousness, I was persecuting the truth. I was persecuting Christians and they had the truth. I was persecuting Jesus. But Paul is okay to go, but I did it. I was doing it thinking I was doing the right thing. That's what he's saying about the Jews. He's saying, look, they're really trying to do the right thing. Don't be so hard on them. They're not all willful, arrogant people. They think they're doing the right thing by obeying all these laws and keeping all this religion. But really all it's leading to is self-righteousness. It's not leading to the pathway to grace and acceptance. And so that's what he's saying. They're zealous, but he says, it says in this version, but it's misdirected zeal. Mm. What does your version say? Zealous for the wrong things or something like that. It says, doesn't uh, it? They are zealous Verse for two. God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Not based on knowledge. Okay. So misdirected knowledge. In other words, they, they didn't realize, well, let's put it this way. They didn't know what they didn't know. They were convinced that they had the, the right pathway to a relationship with God, but they were wrong. They were wrong. And they were convinced of it based upon their understanding of the Bible. And they were wrong. Mm. So that's why Paul uses 10 Bible verses from the Old Testament to show them that they misunderstood their own Bible. God's plan in the book of the book in the Old Testament has always been salvation through God's choice by grace and faith. Did the Pharaohs really like, because they have access to the law, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have access to everything. And surely like they would have like been, oh, okay, this Messiah guy, like surely he's like the one that's predicted throughout. Well, but some did. Some did, like obviously um, Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Yeah, some did. But the majority were blinded by the fact that they had fallen into the trap of thinking that their salvation came, one, by their Jewishness, by birth, and two, by their keeping of the law. When, what, how did they end up becoming so, like, because they, they constantly reference Moses, Moses, yes. Moses, Moses, yep. Moses. 
did they were they just so hyper focused on just keeping the commit or just telling people to keep the commandments but not then keeping it like uh, yes were both, they both <laughs> were they just the the biggest humongous fakers ever they just told hey you can't do this i will like I will give money in the streets sort of thing. Yeah. Like, well, that's actually a really interesting the point because some were faking and yet others were like this. They were zealous, but they were wrong in their zealousness. And I think the problem is when you're wrong in your zealousness, you end up faking it. So I don't think most of the Pharisees were setting out initially to use and abuse and spit out people for their own benefit. Okay. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they were the rich aristocracy. They were a bit different. They were they were much more comfortable with using and abusing people. You've got to separate out the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're two different groups of people. Okay. Pharisees were a group of people who were really just passionate about obeying the law and they were passionate about getting Jews to obey the law because they thought that if Jews obey the law, God would bless them and they'll be part of God's family and God would accept them and God would bless Israel. Israel would he, bless God would bless Israel. Yeah, God would bless their nation if the Jew. So rather than thinking the way to get rid of the Romans – is to kick them out or do what a zealots do and fight against them. They just went around telling people, you need to obey the law because if you obey the law, God will bless our country. That's what they believed. And so they were passionate about it themselves, but in the process they became self-righteous because then they started to think, look how clean I am. Look how much of a law-abiding citizen I am. I obey the law of Moses and you don't. And instead of genuinely wanting them to, they you can see how self-righteousness settles in. And they start to think, look at those puny people down there who aren't like us. They're not righteous like me. And that becomes But there's no, they're not putting out a helping hand. They're, they're just not. saying you are unrighteous. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. And Jesus says it that way. He says, you know, you're like blind leading a blind and you both fall into a pit. <laughs> he says, you know, you, you, you travel over highway and sea to make a child and then you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. Jesus had some pretty hard words to say because of the wrongness of their zealousness. They were passionate. They thought they were doing the right thing, but they missed the spirit of God in the middle of it. The, put it this way. The God they were worshipping was not the God of the Bible. The God they were worshipping was a God that was bound by laws and really was looking for people who would worship him through action. But the God of the Bible is a God who's looking for hearts that were devoted to him. And so he quotes a whole bunch of scriptures to prove that point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And that's kind of where the whole passage is about. God's got it for everybody. Do you have any other things else in your notes there? Um, it seems I do from uh, verses 10, 8 and 10. Mm -hmm. I, I just have something that I've written down. I'll see. I'll read it out and see if it makes sense when I talk about it. And then it might, it might spark have something. a spark, a light bulb. So this is to, I might read it out, but what does, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth, in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. And then nine and ten of these famous verses that you're talking about. Yeah. Right? And then I've got this. Ah, this is what separates us from every, that's right, every other religion. Through God's grace and mercy, we are set free, which allows us to live a godly life and to be confident that he, what's it? He makes us righteous here on earth. And have peace that we know where we are going after. Yep. Yeah. Tell, tell me what you think that's saying. Um, like this, this right here is yeah, essentially what separates Christianity from everything else. Is that it, it's like, hey, but I, I do, I do find it interesting that it's not just if you believe in your heart, but it's you have to audibly confess as well. Mm -hmm. And like I know, like God doesn't just need to like whenever Jesus was doing anything, he doesn't in his heart say, you know, monologue right now. Yep. In in Jesus' mind, he doesn't say, Yeah. In my mind I'm saying, Spirit, get out. He yeah. verbally is like, yep. get out. Yep. Like he uses his voice. So I don't know if like why Why if, is the if, confession important? Yeah. If let's say if you didn't if you didn't confess but you lived in your heart. Yeah. That wouldn't work. Or if you confess with the, Right. Like I think this has been also a thing that's kind of been formularized a bit too much. Yeah. Okay. So as if to say. I'm no exception to this. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Don't we, so we don't want to formalize it to the point where you go, okay, now you need to say these words. In the context of the passage, that doesn't seem to be the big deal Paul's talking about. No. He's talking about a people here who say, oh, I'm a Jew, but they're not really a Jew because they're not actually doing anything. So when I, when I see confession here, 
I think it's more than just saying some kind of magic words out of my heart. It's confession is words will come out of something that's happening inside me. Jesus is out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. The mouth speaks. Oh, okay? yeah. So the natural byproduct of yeah. what's going on inside your heart will be speaking. But I would say it's more than just speaking. It's speaking and doing. It's actually living this kind of faith life, which we, is a different kind of life. I, I need to be able James puts it this way. He says, you, you can say you have faith, with, but if you don't have works, it's dead. He says, you, you want to, I, I can't see your faith, but I can see your faith by your works. So... <clears throat> In other words, if I want to see if Adrian's got faith, I need to be able to look at Adrian's life. What's coming out of his mouth? What's he doing with his time? How is his life adding value to other people? How is he living like Jesus? Because I can't see inside your heart, but I can see by your actions what's inside your heart. Does that make sense? That's why this confession thing is important. Remember, he's rebuking a people who just had this attitude of, I belong to God, I can do what I want. Mm. And he's going, no, no, no. If you're a follower of Jesus, there will be a natural confession that flows out of that. There'll be a confidence and a courage, courageousness and your life will back it up. Mm. And is, is it as soon as you, in that way to make it clearer, like is it, is it as soon as you, in your heart, you are now like your eyes are open and you're like, I believe in like you are Lord in that moment. Is, is that it? Like, cause it's like, oh, once I'm moving into like once saved, always saved. Like, you, you, I see. So yeah. you're moving into the moment of what salvation takes place. And when, yeah, the moment of which salvation takes place. And yeah, because I always dissect. Like You're probably any, doing what most evangelical most, Protestants do. Yeah. Um, and we tend to try to formularize it a bit too much. We tend to try to bring the whole thing down. And there's nothing wrong with trying to bring it down, but then don't form up a, a formula that says, this is how it happens in every situation. It's always the same. Yeah, because because ultimately people walk away. And so it, to formalize it in that way, it's sort of like, well, then where does that lead room for people who've walked away? Yep, and then, yep, exactly. It's like, well, yep. so you can definitely confess with your mouth and still not believe in your heart. Yes, it would appear that there are some who can, or can they stop believing in their heart? Yep. You know, all those sorts of questions which we talked about in yesterday's episode, they're all valid questions yeah. that we need to wrestle with. But also, too, we can we can get so bogged down in that theological wrestling that we we take we try to make these scriptures say things that I'm not convinced Paul was trying to say with them. I think at first value, he's talking here to these Jewish believers who he's trying to remind them that you don't get saved just by your Jewishness and just by obeying law. So he's trying to come at it from that perspective. If we do that, it kind of brings us up a level. We don't get so bogged down in in the weeds of the conversation mm. um, because there are lots of different ways to get saved. You're right. Yeah. That's I, the point. Do you set it like as in a, a very – because – yeah, that sort of leads me into my the next point because there's like talking about, oh, there's a, a, a different way, which I find interesting that when Paul sort of talks about it because he, you know, I think in, where is it, 10? If oh, you, no, no, further, I think. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. No, that's not where it is. 14. How then can anyone call on the one they have not believed in and how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear um, without someone preaching to them and what was it how can anyone preach unless they're sent um sort of interesting because it's like oh how can anyone call on the name of the lord if they don't know it but it's there's also was it what is it the proof like people who do not have the bible proof through his creation yep that, that's romans one what's it it's what's it called something revelation something. yes it's called um uh, general, general revelation, revelation. General general revelation. Re or, or, or another thing is um, it's, there's two different terms for grace. There's um, God's specific grace and God's general grace or something like that. It's not the word yeah. general, but it's another word. But yeah, yeah general revelation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what I mean by people can be saved. Is it, is it, see, Peter shows up in Acts 10. He shows up at Cornelius, the centurion's house. And the guy just start, he start, Peter starts preaching. And the guy just starts speaking in tongues. There's no repentance. There's nothing. It's just like that happened differently. And if you look at all the ways that talk about salvation, some people are just. I think if I, like a few people, some people are just called, right? Like the no. Tell me more. Know, give me that wrong. Like, let's say this this person is like God. Like, let's say they don't have any 
currently Christian influence. They've probably yep. maybe read the Bible once. Like, yeah, sure. Or someone's read it's like a yep. certain chapter and they're just like, Ooh, but whatever. That makes no sense. And then just randomly out of nowhere, they're just like. I see what you're saying. Somehow God just sovereignly puts his finger on their on them life. And they're like. Yeah. That's what yeah. I mean by mixed up in the sovereign will of God. Yeah. Salvation is an amazing thing. If we could explain it, we wouldn't be singing songs about amazing grace. <laughs> this is the point is we, we, Christ, we Christians, yeah. we want to try to explain it. And it's not all bad to want to wrestle with how God saves. But at the same time, we need to recognize that our finite thinking will never figure it out completely. And that's what he's trying to say to these Jews is, and these Gentiles is, this is beyond your human understanding as to how God saves. Just remember, he's chosen you. It's by grace. It's not through your works. Um, so, you know, get on with the business of telling people about it because he's just given this process. If you work backwards through that process, someone has to be sent first, then they have to speak, then someone needs to hear, and then someone needs to believe. That's actually the reverse of what you just read. He says, how can someone believe if they haven't heard? How can someone hear if no one tells them? How can people tell them if they weren't sent? So I've just reversed that process. So what he's saying is, he's saying we all need to not just rest on this whole thing of, oh, God will save whoever. It actually comes back to how are we going to live our lives? Are we going to live lives that are sent, that are that are on mission, that we're going to live lives where we're willing to share God's news with people when we come into contact with it's people? It's the action. It's the action, and that's part of the confession thing. If I'm truly confessing Christ, I'm going to be living that out. Yeah. I know these are complex passages. I'm not – and the thing is I think they're deliberately nuanced. There's all kinds of different – things you can pull out of them. You can read through these passages in Romans 50 times and get 50 different nuances on yeah. the same thing because it's, it's incredibly dense, rich literature. But I think that's what Paul, at face value, I think that's what Paul's trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Cool. Um, I have something in Rome, what, verses 14 to 21. Mm-hmm. Um, how then can anyone call on the one they have not That's believed? It might be talking. what I just said. Well, ha, what's, your, what's your notes? Have you got... What, this is why is Paul saying that we can believe in the one we have heard when... Yeah, I was just quoting... His, what was it? He is made known through his creation. So that well, this is literally the conversation we just had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That was it, was it? I think that was it for the, my notes. But we can still keep reading through it because... I think you read the whole thing, didn't you? I did read you the did whole read thing. You did read the whole chapter. Let me just see if there's any last-minute thoughts that we can pull out before we close out this episode. One thought, verse 19, he says, did the people of Israel really understand? He says, yeah, they actually did. Because even in the time of God, even in the time of Moses, the things that people they're claiming, God said back then, I'm going to arouse, arouse your jealousy by people who aren't even a nation. Which he's quoting from their own Jewish Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, and trying to show the people that God's intention has always been to choose others. So what does that mean for us? It means that at no point should we think that we have a whole, whether that's us because we're Jewish or because neither of us are Jewish, but at no point should we think the way we do church or the kind of people we are or the way we dress or the way we vote or any of those things, somehow we have a wholesale um, claim on God's kingdom. Oh, we're Pentecostal. We do church this way. Are you going to an Anglican church now? The Anglicans, we, the way we do church is the only way to do it. All of those things, Paul, fit into this category. And God just seems to delight in bursting out of our boxes and choosing people who we would not expect him to choose. And so that encourages me because I want to be a person who's radically looking for those that I wouldn't expect. If you're walking down the street and you see someone and think, and your first thought is, oh, God wouldn't choose them. That's the kind of people God wants to choose. So be on that lookout for that kind of thing. If you're going to be sent, be sent with this attitude of anyone who walks to the door of my church, I'm going to love them. Anyone I'll see on the street, I'm going to love them. I'm going to be on mission for them because God loves to actually, He if, if we refuse to do that, if we refuse to have that attitude and we become elitist and think the way we do church is the right way, God's actually going to potentially up and leave us and go find someone else. Mm. So that's kind of the summary. I would say with regard to how to do this. Mm, yeah, I, I, I think that's would have been my biggest concern since I've like changed locations, changed churches. Is that though? I've enjoyed very much the Anglican system, but I enjoy the Pentecostal passion. Right. And so I'm like, I don't want to deny either one. No, they're both valid. They're both, they're both good. beautiful. And I'm like, they're both can they're both working together to 
build up my faith as a Christian. Yes. Not as an Anglican or as a Pentecostal. That's good. Perfect. And, you know, as a Pentecostal, I think there's a lot to value in the tradition. I don't think Pentecostals, I was, I was saying this here on church on Sunday, I think, or at Camden, um, <coughs> Pentecost, I was raised as a Pentecostal where we were kind of called, told to dismiss all the liturgy and all the, because it was all like dead religion. Yeah. You know, don't have any of that. And as I've matured, I've gone, no, that's actually not the case. It can become dead religion, but mm. liturgy didn't start out that way. Liturgy started like a framework that was designed to help me contemplate and pray, like the book of prayer and all those things you'd be familiar with. They, there was beautiful, deep revelation in those things. And I think Pentecostals now are recognizing the importance of being open to that liturgy. And what I'm loving is that I think probably for a long time, certainly among large portions of Anglicanism, for instance, there was probably not an awareness of the spirit. So there was a lot of dead liturgy, but I think there's a, there's a revival among Anglicans where they're starting to come back to some of that. And we're meeting in the middle. I think we're finding a blend of liturgy and the spirit that is rich. So we can value and appreciate the, 2,000 years of church history rather than thinking suddenly we Pentecostals have got it all, but also, too, those that have been raised largely on the structure and the liturgy and the religion can now value, oh, I want the spark. Like you said, you can see there's a spark in Pentecostalism. There's a spark in the charismatic that I want. And marry those two and you'll be in a good place, mate. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. That's enough for today, hey? Absolutely. We'll go on to Romans chapter 12, which has got a lot of famous... Famous verses in it, actually, Romans 12. What? Well, I think we actually got 11 next. Oh. We're already at 10. We're already at 10. We're going to go to 11. <laughs> I actually skipped ahead. You're right. We've got one more to go. <laughs> chapter 11. Thank you for the reminder. We'll talk to you tomorrow on Chapter 11. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bible. Wait, what? Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And you can also find us on all the socials. Just search The Bible. Wait, what? And to find out more about our church, just search C3 Camden, C3 Picton, or C3 Thoreau on the web or on the socials. Thanks for being with us today, and we look forward to talking to you on the next episode of The Bible. Wait, what?